Now, again, Jackie Murphy, welcome. Thank you, Ramona. I'm it, happy to be here. Uh, it's great to have you here again. And now, you are a special education advocate. Yes. Okay. What was your journey into becoming a special education advocate, and why do you have that passion that really makes the difference? I'm a parent of a child with special needs, and my journey began when my son, um, at age two um, was missing that critical milestone where children are supposed to start putting their two words together. You know, all the pediatricians ask, how many words is your child saying? And parents keep lists. And um, developmentally, I was concerned because I was noticing that when my child was with um, a group of other kids um, in play group, he didn't seem to really um, be interacting with them. It mm -hmm. didn't seem like he was recognizing sort of um, that this is a social situation. He seemed to be in his own world. You often hear that from parents of children um, with autism, and my son is on the autism spectrum. Um, and so I sought the um, expertise of the pedi my pediatrician at the time, um, and this was in another state, but my pediatrician assured me that um, my child is so extroverted, there's no need to be worried. You know, your child is developing fine. He's maybe a little slower. Um, I also sought, um, the advice of early intervention. Um, and they did a whole series of tests with him and played games with him. We spent hours, they um, checked his um, hearing, they checked his vision, um, physically he's perfectly healthy, and they told me he's a young two. Um, and it wasn't until we got to Massachusetts and um, found a really good pediatrician, you know, through a recommendation of a friend, and um, she finally addressed my concern and said, well, yes, he does have a speech delay, and let's do some further testing to make sure it's nothing more. Um, and I was so grateful for her advice. I think a lot of times parents, you know, are, um, don't want to ask questions when their kids um, aren't kind of doing the same thing as other kids. We all want to believe that, you know, things will come along and um, it, everything will work mm -hmm. out. And I think it's, it must be hard for frontline providers um, to kind of approach parents and kind of break the news to them that, you know, that they believe the parents should seek out some further um, assessment, mm -hmm. but I think it really is the job of those frontline providers to do it because if you, do, a lot of times, the earlier you're able to intervene, the more likely you are to make really good progress with your child. And there's really no reason not to wait, especially with a child who um, may have symptoms at a young age. You know, mm -hmm. before age five, they look at all the um, the neurons in the brain, and there's more at that age than you know in those young years than when we get older. And so that's the time when we can really have um, an effect with um, intervention. What are the some of the diagnosis that would be in an IEP? So someone who didn't know about an IEP sure. would, would say? No, this is for anyone. And the criteria to have an individual education plan is that the ch there's three criteria. The child has a disability. The disability affects the child's ability to make progress in the general uh, education curriculum mm -hmm. and the child would benefit from special education. Now there are times where a child might have a disability but it may not um, affect that child's ability to make progress in the general curriculum or that child might not benefit from special education. So they have to meet all three criteria and some examples of where you know a, a disability wouldn't require uh, an individual education plan um, are for instance blindness or deafness where you know an accommodation is necessary um, in order to help the child access the curriculum and that might be you know a cochlear implant or you know preferential seating in the classroom mm -hmm. um, and that would be provided under a plan that's called a 504 plan okay. and that's another law um, yeah. that's the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 okay. but this um, an individual education plan is in particular for children who, who, because of their disability, cannot make progress in the general curriculum and need special education. Oh, okay. And this is where the actual curriculum is modified. You know, under a 504 plan, the curriculum isn't modified, it's just that we provide so the, some the, assistance. There's assistance, but they sit in the class and they learn at the same pace, mm -hmm. in the same way mm -hmm. as the, the teacher has structured the class, That's the right. learning of the class. That's right. Where a child with an IEP may be in their, maybe one-on-one, -on -one, they may be with a group of other children in their own classroom, mm -hmm. or they may be in a general classroom, but have and they also different have individual people goals. working with them. 
the, I think the point of the IEP is that that child has individual goals that are separate from the general ed curriculum, you know, mm -hmm. a goal in, in reading, you know, to reach a certain level, whereas the other children are getting, you know, measured according to one benchmark. This child has a separate benchmark, you know, because they may not be able to read as easily, or a goal, for instance, of toileting, you know, that mm -hmm. the other general ed mm -hmm. teacher uh, kids don't, you know, need, but this child in particular needs work in that area. So the point is, think of this is that this child um, has particular goals that are outside, you know, or in addition to the general ed curriculum that they need to meet. And that they need to meet, yeah. yeah. There is a lot of, um, there's a lot of talk about it, but it's a very big field. Could you recommend some books that someone oh, might right. um, read, a parent might read that, or even a grandparent? I mean, I think it's important to kind of understand, especially if you have a child that has needs, just to kind of assure yourself and know that there's support out there mm -hmm. for you, that there are this outreach and that it's it's not abnormal. It's it's yeah. just part of life. I think it's very helpful for parents to speak with parents so you can seek out um, other support groups and here in Massachusetts we have the Federation for Children with Special Needs which is sort of like an umbrella organization. Um, they help with the education of parents, they provide training, they also provide um, uh, another group is called Family Ties, which is um, one of their sort of subset organizations that kind of provides family to family information mm -hmm. and can help identify specialists. Um, I also brought a book with me that um, is really helpful for parents who are just getting into it um, mm -hmm. called From Emotions to Advocacy by um, Pete Wright. And he's sort of the guru of um, special education law. He's um, been before the Supreme Court. Um, the Rights Law website is really excellent, www.rightslaw.com. And this book in particular um, takes parents from the point where you have the diagnosis but you really don't know um, it, what the next step is. Mm -hmm. It teaches you how to write letters, you know, that document facts, you know, mm -hmm. so should you need to go further in the process, your file is complete and mm -hmm. you can hand that over to an advocate or an attorney to say, this is documentation of all the steps we've been through up until now. It teaches parents how to um, look at those d assessments and standardized mm -hmm. scores and actually translate those into, you know, a, a 12 on this particular test really means that my child is functioning in the, you know, 90th percentile, which means that they're actually, you know, doing better than, right. you know, 90% of their peers or something. Um, it also teaches parents how to, like, keep those records and how to, because what you'll quickly find um, as a parent of any child with special needs is that you, the paperwork is is endless and I have binders, you know, two of them, three of them that are like this big, you know, mm -hmm. with, mm -hmm. because not only are you getting your individual education plans, you're getting progress reports, which um, are sort of the, the documentation of what kind of progress you're making mm -hmm. on the plan, yeah. and you get those as often as you get your um, report cards, you know, and then you've got your outside specialists who are kind of, you know, periodically reassessing your child. You're keeping records of that. The school is conducting their, you know, periodic And hopefully the parent is journaling. Yes, right. You so know you what got I mean? so to, to make this this whole thing, yeah, a coherent story, yeah. right, which is really important. And that's, I think, another role that I can play is to educate the parents because in the long run, they are the folks that are going to be with their child, you know, for the entire journey. Others will come in and out of it, but only the parents are going to know the whole story. And if they have the tools to advocate on behalf of their child, that's the best that you could hope for. Do you work with any um, clients who have their students, uh, who have their children, excuse me, who have their children in um, an educational setting that would be around the clock? Oh, like a residential. Like a residential. Um, I've, I have, I do have other parents that are not my clients, but just among my circle of friends mm -hmm. whose kids are in, in residential settings. So I understand a little bit about that. Yeah, and they, they could also benefit from. Uh, oh, from certainly. Your services, because certainly. I think sometimes maybe people think, well, if the child is in a so-called boarding school or school twenty-four-seven, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, and they only come home in the summer, then. They're, they're going to take care of everything. But there's still the be... same requirement for the individual education plan, and I think it's still important for the parents. Any kid, you know, needs their mom and dad to be there as the bridge between that child and the providers, you know, and so you're just there representing, you know, the best, the interests and the voice of that child, child. at the table. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Thank you so much. We wish you much success. Thank you, Ramona. It's a pleasure. Thank you. I am Ramona, and you've been watching Ramona Interviews. Have a wonderful week.